So folks, it's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to the Spitzer School of Architecture, both the audience, excuse me, online, as well as the audience in the room. We're here continuing our uh, um, series, spring, uh, sorry, fall lecture series, Border Crossings, Architecture and Migration in the Americas. And this Siami lecture series is made possible by the Spitzer Architecture Fund and the generous support of Frank Siami, 74, class of 74, and CEO of Siami Construction. Uh, for those online who may not know me and for anyone else who may not know me, my name is Marta Gutman and I'm the Dean of this wonderful school. So as is our want, we will begin by acknowledging that our school, grounded on the schist bedrock outcrop of Harlem, is situated upon the ancestral homeland and territory of the Muncie Lenape, Wappinger, and Wequasajek peoples. As members of an educational community, we are obliged to know the histories of dispossession that have allowed this college to flourish and to grow and to thrive on a vibrant terrain. As designers and thinkers, we endeavor to always to build in ways that lead toward justice, and we are committed to working to dismantle the ongoing consequences of settler colonialism. So it has been my honor and privilege this semester to work with Dr. William Brinkman Clark, visiting scholar here at Spitzer to curate this series. And William will, uh, will introduce our guest speaker uh, right now. Hey, thank you. Okay, so thank you all for being here as we do every time we start off these things. Uh, thank you very much to Martin to the whole CUNY community for hosting this uh, lecture series. Uh, it's my turn to introduce uh, Miguel Rabago, who is not only an excellent academic, he's also a friend of mine. Um, I, I kind of liked the way Brad introduced me last time, so I'll, I'll try to make it a little bit more personal, like, like Brad did. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen Fight Club. There's this great scene at the end where uh, Tyler Durden is with, with Marla and everything's exploding. And he says, you met me in a very weird time in my life. Um, I met uh, Miguel in a very weird time in his life uh, when he was actually blowing up symbolic buildings around him. And I got him to know as he was doing this. Um, and he was always doing it out of a place of um, values and, and, and honor and what he thought was right for him and his profession at the moment. I'm obviously not going to say which were the buildings he was exploding or burning down, but it was a, a very interesting time to get to know a person. And since that moment, almost 10 years ago, we've become uh, good friends and contributed in uh, many academic and personal endeavors, even though we are in different fields. So uh, Miguel is actually uh, originally a lawyer, but he uh, delves into many other things that have to do and don't have to do with the law. So uh, without much further ado, uh, he, is, he has a master's in Latin American stu studies at UNAM. He has a doctorate uh, in, and we were just discussing on how you say this, but law, I guess, is a, a doctorate in law in the University of Salamanca. From 2016 to 2021, he was a, a visiting scholar at the Universidad de los Andes in, in Colombia where he was the head of a tandem team project with the Max Planck, Max Planck Institute uh, in Heidelberg, uh, doing uh, research on international relations. And uh, since then, he is a professor at CIDE, which is the Centro de Investigación y Desarrollo de Investigación y Docencia, which is Center for Research of, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's a very high end research facility in, in, in Mexico, where he uh, studies and gives classes on legal theory and international law and international law theory and relations. So um, great, gives me great honor to present uh, to you, Miguel Trabo Dorbeck. Well, thank you very much uh, for that presentation, William. Uh, I think that in many ways, when William was saying that I was destroying some buildings, it was the classic positivist, uh, mostly 
rudimentary practice of law and unequal practice of law, which he was meaning. No, but the truth is that still you're going to hear a bit about law in this lecture. So bear with me. I'm not the German law professor. Every professor has the German law professor thing in him, but it's not my thing, no. So we're going to talk about the legal geographies of agricultural borderlands, migrant labor, food, and waterways. And I'm very excited to give this lecture in the wonderful uh, cycle of, of conferences you've had on migration and taking on the issue of migration, especially in an architecture school. school. Even though my field is quite uh, far away from architecture, as you can see, um, I am very, I'm, I was always kind of amazed, but not that much, of how much the architectural metaphor sometimes pops up in law, even in very positivistic and very legalistic and formalistic areas of law, because the structure traditional of traditional architecture, the if you take the measures and the um, basic aesthetics of Greek uh, and Roman architecture, you can probably have an idea of the strict and forms of law and how it's thought, you know. But to get into our topic, no? first of all, I will try to do three things in this talk. One is to give you a brief and general theory of what, I, uh, what I'm referring to as agricultural borderlands, and also how basically law configures space in many ways. This is a typical uh, uh, topic in legal geography, but still, most of the time we think, especially from critical legal studies and from other uh, views uh, critical of law, we think of law as being, in Marxist terms, part of the superstructure, not the structure, or being ideology in many ways, and not really channeling or materializing the real social relationships, which are mostly structured through economics, not law. But I think the law has really a part of structure, and this is where the architectural metaphor comes from. No, it really uh, especially international trade law, which is, and as you will see in a minute, it's very much central to my talk, is kind of a structure where economics ki kind of build or builds economics into that structure. It's a combination of both economics and legal possibilities, which enable and disable some contact points, which enable and, dis and disable some economic relationships, which enable and both enable and disable some movement of goods, services, foreign capital, and of course, people yeah. as in migration. No? So there's this relationship between law and, and space. Now we were talking in a very interesting seminar that I had the pleasure to be invited now about things like territory, but in law, we also think about jurisdiction, state. You no, know? if you see the difference between state, territory, jurisdiction is always legally based in some ways. No, it's a fiction. No, borders may be a fiction. They seem like a fiction, but sometimes they're materially uh, overpresent. For example, the US Mexican border. No, it's a place, a necropolitical space, a, a place where without the legal capacities to cross, you can get killed, you can get detained, you, awful things can happen to you, no? But also the fiction that law is centered around a territory is that a legal fiction in many ways, no? Because there's also extra, extra territorial application, international application, transnational and private application of law in many ways, no? So the relationship between law and space, it's much more complicated than what we think traditionally is just the containment of law in one territory for one state. So what happens here? We have amplification and collapse of law in many ways. Yeah, okay. So what do I mean by amplification of law? If law, <laughs> you can't see the red then. Sorry about that. Well, the, yeah. Is yeah. that good? Yeah. Okay. Excuse me for the interruption. No, no problem. And uh, well, as I was saying, no, there's some amplification of law. If you think of the concept, the audio concept of amplification is taking sound from one place to the other. Well, law can be transported from one place to the other. And we call that, or in legal theory, we call it extraterritorial application of the law. Let's think, for example, of a crime committed in the US and 
a person who is detained in Mexico and is extradited to the US, not a very uncommon practice, unfortunately, no. Uh, this is some type of amplification of US law, which has to be uh, basically uh, enforced by Mexican authorities with Mexican cooperation through Mexican channels, but the law remains US law. It's just applied and executed by Mexican authorities through a complex, uh, a complex treaty and complex uh, international relations. And there's also collapse as the US, to go to my example of extradition, expands its law into Mexico, for example, for the attainment of drug lords, extradition of drug lords, whatever. Mexican law kind of collapsed because you, in a sense, uh, recognize that your law is not working in order to uh, prosecute the same crimes as these drug lords have committed also in Mexico. No? So, what is this? Uh, what do we think when we think about territory? Well, to me, and I'm a son of the border in many ways. My mother's from Tijuana, no? My grandfather was from Tamaulipas, the regions we were going to talk about that, no? In many ways, this, this is the physical border. This is the territory. This is the jurisdiction. These are the containments of both law, uh, goods, people, whatever, no? This is the traditional borderlands, no? a very nice picture of those traditional borderlands. But there's also other borderlands which are not that present, that physical, especially regarding US-Mexican relationships, which is my main topic. What are those borderlands? Those borderlands are here in New York City, no? And I will talk about those borderlands in New York City. And we carry them in our bodies, and we carry them in many ways in our customs, and we carry them in our daily life. And they are not constrained to a physical division between a country and another. And they also have some legal uh, basics, some legal implications. No? So this is basically some of the theories I oh, what happened? Yeah. Some of the theories I'm I'm working on, no? And basically I will give you two examples. No, uh, basically one regarding the physicality of the border. Yeah, in the borderlands and regarding water use in the borderlands. And another, which is uh, a concept and a study done by Alicia Galvez, who's a professor here at CUNY no, in Latin American studies, about uh, the changes and uh, the uses of Mexican food and Mexican diet and Mexican agricultural products and the whole food systems in, in regard, uh, between the Mexico and US. No? That's called eating NAFTA. That's the translation that was presented last week in Mexico, no? And also the work of Melissa Castillo, which is a Mexican state of mind, which is also around New York City and about the customs of newly, uh, newly come Mexican migrants to New York City. And in a sense, this will represent the non-physical area of the border. So here's the old border and the new border, no? If you see the old border, we know it very well. This is a, uh, the part of the border I've been talking about, which is uh, the border between Tamaulipas. You know, you can see the state. My grandfather's from that state, no? and or was from that state, and East Texas. No, this is also an agricultural area, uh, an agricultural area of irrigation, and it also covers many big cities in Mexico, no? Reynosa, Matamoros, and also more towards the south, Monterrey, which is the Depends on who you ask, the second or third largest city in Mexico. I'm from Guadalajara, and I would say the third, no, but still, it's uh, one of the most important cities in Mexico. And regarding local GDP, regarding uh, economic production, it's the second most important city in Mexico, no? So uh, this is a very, very interesting area, not only because of, it's in South Texas, but you have agriculture, you have border crossing, you have migrants, and, in, and also in this area over here, you have one of the most strongest necropolitical areas in Mexico, Tamaulipas, especially No Laredo, Matamoros. It's an area where uh, there's tons of goods, tons of services passing, crossing, but also a drug, uh, almost, uh, I would say, uh, an area very competed and very violent uh, for drug trafficking, no? very much a very violent zone. And 
next to that, you have a photograph, which I was thinking it's not very representative, but maybe you can, this is a paquete. This is basically a box, no? Uh, with Mexican products, food products, fruit, uh, food staples, no? From every region of Mexico, that many people from, New that live in New York City and other areas, but especially in New York City, who are called paqueteos, no? bring from the traditional communities of people who have migrated more recently to Mexico, especially from La Mixteca, no, which is a common zone from Guerrero, Puebla, no, uh, which has its, its traditional cuisine, its traditional staples, and also from other places which uh, migrants in New York City come from. And these paqueteros basically fly no, they're people normally maybe U.S. citizens in, in sometimes or permanent residents which can cross or which were crossing. No, this is Alicia Galvez study. No, uh, to Mexico and bringing traditional food. You know uh, the traditional tortillas from uh, the grandmother. Traditional uh, food items like very amaranto things which were very hard to get in New York City before we had more Mexican communities and Latino communities in New York City, no? But one of the things is that agriculture is at the center of migration in many ways, not only through food production, through food uh, uh, trade, but also through agricultural workers. And also NAFTA, which is the legal instrument, which has changed in radically the relationship in this agricultural borderlands, which is my main thesis, no? Is not the first, uh, it's not the ending point and it's not the beginning of the story of agricultural borderlands, as we can see in this slide. No? So this is the Bracero program. No? You heard this before the Great Depression and afterwards and, and, and during, the, during the Great Depression, there was a suspension of the Bracero program, which is a project basically of the US and Mexican government to bring agricultural workers to uh, areas, especially in California, no? To work in agriculture, no. And this, uh, both both uh, drawings are from Mexican and from U.S. Well, these are Mexican uh, uh, newspapers, no. And there's uh, an English manual for braceros. And basically, this program what encourages is people from rural Mexico to migrate to the U.S. who had agriculture skills, who had traditional uh, knowledge of, of agriculture, and to come to work to the same area, no that is agriculture in, in the US, no? The problem is that after the Great Depression, after World War II, after the 50s, and especially during the, the drug wars in, 70, in the 70s, migration not only changed in its configuration from uh, Mexican agricultural temporary workers or workers with regular permits, no? but it changed also into agricultural workers migrating to Mexican cities and also agricultural workers migrating to US cities, no? but working at services in other areas which are non-agricultural. So what happens is you have a process of, they call it depresentation. No? I, I don't like the word a lot, but it means that the traditional knowledge in, of agricultural workers gets lost because they go to the city and basically they work in jobs in the service sector, for example, in restaurants, for example, in other ways. But as Alicia Galvez has also proven, this has recently taken an interesting and paradoxical turn in New York because these agricultural workers or the sons of agricultural workers are working in services, first uh, like in very, very um, entry job positions in restaurants like washing dishes or whatever, but they have basically moved towards the upper ladder in New York City and now working as in kitchens and are developing some of the skills they knew from their grandmothers, from their mothers in the New York City restaurants. And some of them have even opened their own restaurants. So it's a very, very interesting thing. But this is the Bracero program, no? which was the traditional way in which agriculture was uh, based in the borderlands. This is another, uh, this is a US uh, medium, no? As you can see, very uh, stereotyped, very complicated. No? So we have the physical borderlands. And just bear with me. This is the legal part in many ways. I'm going to focus on a case no, uh, that's derived from NAFTA. NAFTA, as you know, is a free trade agreement or was the free trade agreement that governed 
Mexican, Canadian, and US relations, trade relationships uh, between Canada, the US, and Mexico in 1994, which was negotiated during the 90s, uh, end of the 80s, uh, beginning of the 90s, a very high point for neoliberal economic policy in Mexico and in Latin America, no? And uh, NAFTA had a chapter, no, because it now has been replaced by USMECA, the US, Mexican, and Canada Free Trade Agreement, which basically responds to the same structure, the same uh, needs, which mean to facilitate not the free movement, but the movement without uh, containment, without restrictions, without legal restrictions for uh, customs or for other barriers or other uh, trade barriers for goods, for services, and for foreign investment, not for people. No, this is very important. So in the physical borderlands, that place in Tamaulipas and Texas, East Texas that I was talking about, these farmers, no, or I wouldn't say farmers, maybe agriculture entrepreneurs, no, uh, that were grouped around the Bayview Irrigation District or the uh, many irrigation districts in Southeast Texas, around Mission, around other places, no? They filed this suit, no? This claim, no? It's in an international tribunal. It's uh, called the international, well, the system comes from the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes and in international law, we call that international investment agreements, which are basic agreements between two or more countries in which you provide for conditions for foreign investment. And basically you establish an arbitration, which means private litigation for disputes involving an investor from one country because uh, in investments in another country, in this case, from Canada to Mexico, from the US to Mexico, from Mexico to Canada, from Mexico, to the US or from the US to Canada and vice versa, no? Uh, and you provide for this private parties claims, this uh, litigation by arbitrators in private, in private, uh, a private tribunal, in cases which are supposed to be expropriation or tantamount to expropriation, which means basically if your property is taken away, this would be the original meaning of that case. But as you will see in this case, it goes far beyond just the taking of property. It becomes a way in which private investors, foreign investors can basically challenge any legitimate regulation by their government. That means taxing, that means environmental regulation, that means health regulations, that means a whole tantamount of possibilities of regulation. No? So what does this have to do with agriculture? Well, Bayview Irrigation District, the claimants, no, were claiming against the uh, against Mexico that basically Mexico was not uh, acting on a 1944 treaty, no, which is a treaty between the U.S. and Mexico regarding the use of water of several rivers in this area. And basically, they were saying, and this is the interesting part for me how NAFTA has changed the physical border. They were saying Mexico is not complying with a 1944 treaty, which, me, which basically stated that you have to give an amount of water you know, to the US. And why does this concern some private parties? Because there are irrigation, uh, irrigation districts. And in this irrigation districts, they use that water for agricultural purposes. And since they are not getting that water, they had made more investment in pumps and other infrastructure in order to uh, keep farming with less water. And when the drought, and when a series of droughts, have, this is a map of the hydrology of the border, no? which is quite interesting, no? Uh, when basically drought and restrictions and the building of uh, by the Mexican government of many dams in Mexican territory started to deplete the amount of water that was going to the US, these farmers have basically pressured Texas governors, the federal government to establish a claim against Mexico for not 
complying with this treaty. No? And basically their argument, and this is what's interesting for me, that it changes the geography, changes the way in which the US and Mexico are, are relating, and also the borders in many ways, is that they are saying, my investment is not only the pumps and the infrastructure and the farms that I have in the US, it's Mexican water, which has not been given to me by an international treaty that provides for that water to be given to the US. This practically means that it, the a treaty, which is between two countries, you skip diplomatic, uh, diplomatic ways of, of uh, dealing with the alleged, uh, alleged breach of the treaty, no? And you privatize the claim. Basically, the irrigation districts, which are a very complex public-private entity, but which are privately based in many ways in the Texas Water Code, they are claiming that Mexico should give them water, basically. No? Even though the claim didn't prosper, the interesting thing is what they put in their claim. And they basically argued that not only Mexico was not giving, their, giving them enough water for them to produce uh, the normal amount of products to maybe also export to Mexico again, you know, because these areas, you know, Reynosa, Nuevo Laredo, all those are very important entry points for food merchandises into Mexico and from Mexico to the US. Um, basically, they were saying uh, not only that they were getting the water and that they couldn't basically uh, proceed with uh, their agricultural activities and that they had to make all this investment, this infrastructure investment, but they also said that that water was theirs, you know, that that was their investment, that water in, in Mexico. So they're probably the proprietors of a body of water which is regulated by law in Mexico. So this is kind of this amplification of law, uh, amplification of legal tenure of property from the border to the other side of the border. I mean, this claim didn't prosper, but just the issue that was there is very interesting and very important. Second, and this is what I find much more interesting, is that they, when they filed the claim, they were saying, not only that Mexico has reached the treaty, that hasn't uh, given them water, this is an ongoing uh, problem. And it's not just the US and Mexican uh, border. You can see even uh, much more stronger uh, international relations problems, and even uh, the possibility of, of armed conflict for example, between Palestine and Israel, uh, Israel and Syria, or for example, regarding the use of water, no? And also regarding the Nile Valley, no? Between Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, uh, which has been an ongoing, an ongoing problem, no? But still, this is an ongoing problem between the US and Mexico, not only the use of these rivers in the Eastern part of Mexico and the US, but also all around the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo Basin and around most of, of the border, no? But also they claimed something which was much more interesting to me. They said, not only has Mexico breached the need for us to get this water and they haven't, uh, haven't uh, honored the 1944 treaty, but also they are producing, uh, they are producing cit cit citrus fruits, vegetables, which need a lot of water. And they're, they're using not that water, but other waters from irrigation districts in Chihuahua to basically compete with us. And these, these vegetables and these fruits are entering to the point of, of entries in which our products used to enter. So the argument is very interesting in a way. They say, well, not only are you breaching the treaty, you're not giving us the water, but also you're producing the same fruits and vegetables, which I am producing with your water you know, and exporting to your country. So this is a bit representative of how NAFTA has changed the border in many ways. The border is still uh, this, but still the amplification, the interrelationship, the porousness of the border is in many ways represented by these legal problems, because you see the claims that are basically destroying this concrete wall, which some American politicians are so fond of, no? Um, so this claim, I mean, it's 
for me, very representative of, of the problems around agriculture. But if you take it not to agriculture, but you kind of point out not only the relationship between goods, but also the production and the scheme of production by agricultural workers in Mexico, it has a broader and more complex uh, meaning. For example, why are people migrating from small rural towns to the US? Basically, because they cannot uh, rely on basic agriculture for uh, to, to basically cover their basic needs, which was historically the ways in which farmers and people in small towns survive producing their food. But now you have an influx of US products, not just US products from all over the world, from Chile, from Peru, agricultural products are coming and they have displaced obviously local products. And this means that many farmers have seen the prices of their, uh, of their fruits, of their vegetables being dropped to the ground, especially regarding the problem with milpa. Milpa is corn, but it's the agricultural system in which corn is traditionally produced in Mexico. It does not mean only monoculture of in corn fields that run for miles and miles and miles. It's a cyclic uh, agricultural technology, which dates to pre-Columbian times, and which basically unites not only corn, but also the basic food staples of Mexico, uh, squash, um, uh, beans, uh, chili, uh, amaranto, a lot of uh, uh, quilites, other, other agricultural products. No? And also, uh, it incorporated some insects, which were also in pre-Columbian pre times, they were also useful food. So it's a complete agricultural system. So when you displace corn, you're not displacing only the production of corn that would be used in the main food staples in Mexico as tortillas, as uh, tacos, as uh, tostadas, as all the very, very important uh, ways in which corn is turned into food in Mexico. But also you are destroying uh, the production of small little small production of beans, of squash, of other things, no? So we come to the new borderlands, no? And we come to New York City in many ways. New York City wasn't a typical immigration destination for Mexicans, no? It used to be, of course, the largest Latino population and traditional Latino population was came from Puerto Rico, no? And from other Caribbean states in in, in in a sense, no, but since 1994, and the two pivotal points are 1994 and 9-11 in many ways, the securitization of the border, the relationship between migration and trade and other areas and economic integration, and the loss of the opportunity by Mexican politicians, no, because of internal um, political strifes and also because of 9-11, to get a whole enchilada, it was called then, no? before 2011, a great uh, uh, agreement on migration with the US, no? and the loss of the opportunity in NAFTA to include uh, a migration or a free movement of people. There's, there's, some, there's a very technical area about movement of people, which only concerns business people and the issuing of visas no? for NAFTA, but it hasn't been implemented as it should. And also another, in another negotiation in the SMECA, we also lost the opportunity to include some free movement of persons in NAFTA no? in many ways. So this has led to, uh, I, I don't think we were talking about, this is very controversial in many ways, but in some studies and some studies before the COVID pandemic, of course, no, tend to, see Mexican migration and the general migration of Mexicans to be descending, no, in some ways, uh, since basically mid 2000s and the end of 2000s, no. Post COVID, it's another issue, no, but it's clearly descending, no. But still the traditional places of uh, settlement of Mexican migrants, no, especially in the California area, especially in Chicago, especially in other cities have changed, no? Because border crossings are not done in the same places. And also the relationships between people and also the persecution by police and migration officers have draw, drove in Mexican uh, migrants to places where they weren't so present, no? For example, the Midwest, 
for example, New York, for example, other places. No? So this is kind of an explanation of why New York is becoming also a place of uh, migration uh, for Mexicans, no? because the migration dynamic has changed in many ways. And also, New York is also, I mean, we have to, to be conscious of this. It also receives, which is a lesser known, lesser uh, visually and rhetorically in politics uh, known migration, but it also is a city which attracts migrants, uh, Mexican migrants, but highly trained or highly uh, highly specialized migrants into New York City. No, this is another place. I'm talking mostly of new migrants from La Mixteca, from this area of uh, Mexico, no? and also from Tlaxcala and Puebla, the other places where many Mexican migrants come from. If you go to a very posh restaurant in New York City and you ask the waiter, probably he's from Tlaxcala or Puebla in many, in many areas. No? And so, the thing is that this has changed the dynamics of migration, not only from the origin, not only for the destination, but also the context of migration. No, if you go to Los Angeles, as you know, to me, Los Angeles is the biggest, the second biggest city in Mexico in many ways. No, because it's so many Mexican uh, population there, you really feel at home. It's very culturally identified with Mexico. No, in many ways. No, so if you go to to Los Angeles, you can go to a all Mexican supermarket and you'll have not only the food staples but also the brands of soap from Mexico, the uh, shampoo, the things which many migrants miss, which I don't miss particularly but many migrants miss, no? Um, and they'll buy and they'll, you have that very accessible and not only in small bodegas or in small sh shops or whatever, in big huge commercial chains, no? This is, there's uh, this big areas. No, this use isn't the case in New York City. No, we're, we're just talking uh, before in the seminar about uh, handmade tortillas. They're hard to get in. They're impossible to get to Manhattan. And I think the place that we're talking about is this, Cienega Las Playudas de Oaxaca Mexican Cuisine in Corona Avenue in Queens. No, I, I use this example because it, it comes from uh, La Mixteca, from the area where most uh, Mexican migrants, no, uh, new Mexican migrants to New York City are coming. So drawing on that work of Alicia Galvez, those old physical borderlands kind of mutate into a new, and this is not my saying, this is Gloria Salduo, who she, in the beginning of La Frontera, the borderlands talks about the physical and the more psychological or more emotional borderlands, no, have moved into the bodies of Mexican people in the US, the bodies of Mexican people in Mexico, influenced by new consumption patterns of food and importation of food by the US. So what is my, my thesis there? My thesis is, and this is drawing on Alicia Galvez, no, that not only the, the borderlands have been transformed, as I was saying, in the amplification of law or the retraction of law systematically in order to produce not only these claims for property outside of the US, but also to configure the supply chains and near shoring chains, which are bringing the US much more closer and even US security policy much more closer to Mexico. Uh, last year, was last year or the year before, I can't remember, but uh, President Biden uh, had an executive degree, uh, executive decree, sorry, in which he said that there were some basic areas in which the US needed for security reasons to basically uh, guarantee its provisions of goods in order to have a supply chain working. What are the areas? The automobile in industry, and especially electric cars, and especially batteries, which are mostly produced in China. And the project is nearshoring those uh, productions into Mexico. What other thing? Uh, energy and energy uh, products, especially petroleum, gas, and everything in which Mexico is not, uh, uh, I mean, the biggest player in the area, but it's a very important player, no, still. And another area is regarding food systems and regarding uh, the production and importation of food. Not only don't think of food just for direct consumption, no, but think of food as an industry, as oil or palm oil, or as uh, corn oil, which is basically, uh, 
the basic uh, element in all industrial production of processed foods, which is a big industry for the U.S. So sometimes the U.S. takes palm oil or uh, corn oil, which is produced in the U.S. most of the time, but it also imports some of it, you know, and turns it into hundreds of products, which inundate many, a lot of markets of processed foods. And the food system market has changed in order that the basic foods and, and basic fresh foods pro are a part of international trade and agriculture, but now it's becoming much more profitable to export highly processed foods because they have a higher content, they have higher price, et cetera. No? And this is becoming and changing the world systems uh, pro products um, uh, trade relations. No? So what is happening with the US and Mexico in this sense, no? in this scenario? First of all, people in Mexico are adapting, not only because US produced foods are being flooded to Mexico. This is a very, very partial um, engagement with the problem. It's because lifestyles are changing. For example, working hours are changing. Now, mostly in Mexico City, it's hard to, to see someone who has the traditional working hours in which he goes to eat at his house for two hours, has maybe a siesta and goes back to work and works late. No, we have now lunch is going uh, around 12, no, like in the US, like in most continental Europe, like in most parts of the world, no. But also uh, people are working continuously, larger, larger hours, no, and don't have the, the time to go to the house to eat. See, the most people live in the cities. There's a more urban concentration since the 50s till now, no? And this is changing the Mexican diet. So in a sense, it's very paradoxically that as in New York, you have new migrations, new migrants that have brought Mexican, and especially high-end Mexican food and fusion Mexican food to New York City, which was not that present as it was in Los Angeles historically or Chicago or whatever, no? But you have this, this new uh, Mexican food fad in many ways. Many New Yorkers are coming to Mexico City, especially uh, as digital nomads, as uh, wor working in uh, other places. And they are bringing and changing food habits also, no? looking for authentic Mexican food, but looking at authentic Mexican food at high-end restaurants in Mexico City. So this is changing the market a lot, but our bodies are changing also. No, and I'm saying our bodies because it's my case also. You're changing your eating habits, you're importing some things, you're changing your work habits and diabetes, hypertension and other diseases re uh, related to diets are soaring in Mexico. And the Mexican government had last year, no, two years ago, basically restricted the access for uh, treatment of kidney, uh, kidney diseases and dialysis and all these uh, areas in the public uh, health sector. This is changing, but also it changed before for Mexican migrants who were coming to the US, who were changing their, uh, their food systems, they were changing their working hours, they were changing their food habits, and they were getting more propensed towards uh, health problems. Also, uh, having the limitation of the access to health in the US, which is a big issue, as you all know. No? But also, from this very dark picture, very negative picture, you can also see this community effects of the borderlands, of the non-physical borderlands, in which not only bodies are being are getting sick, are being uh, basically uh, it's a national pandemic diabetes and, and diabetes in, in Mexico, and it's a pandemic also for Mexican migrants and Mexican people of Mexican origin in the U.S. No, for example, but also uh, you can if you we go back to the paqueteros, you can see a way of circumventing the law of restricting of looking for loopholes in the law in which people bring objects of effect. I don't know how much it costs. I, I, haven't, done, I don't, haven't done that field work. I just let, read Alicia Scalvey's work and everything, but it's very common and it must be very expensive to get, for example, uh, corn, uh, 
corn uh, leaves, no? dry corn leaves in order to do tamales or whatever. And these are kind of the things that they bring, amaranto, some kinds of chiles from that place. What is the legality of this? First of all, what's the first thing they ask you when you get to a flight? Did you pack your bag? No, of course not. You've got the paqueteros work as getting bags were previously packed from mothers, from uh, sisters, from relatives, from whomever, no, from Mexico to the US. So they're loopholding that first restriction, especially after 9-11. Second, you are passing customs, no? Do you have anything to declare? No, I don't have anything to declare. Any agricultural products? No, you have Oja Santa, you have uh, many products which would be considered as uh, um, agricultural products. But you, this violation of the law is also done in a sense for effective reasons, for reasons in which you keep that relationship with the land, that relationship with the place where you come from. And these people, the paqueteros, risk. You can talk, call them traffickers, or you can call them keepers of the real Mexican cuisine, which many New Yorkers who live in Mexico seem to experience. So it's all the way around, no? in many ways. So in my point is that in many ways, those borderlands are, or the legal borderlands, are expanding, retracting, no? and ca causing a vast array of legalities and illegalities which are combined in order to provide a more integrated sense of what the borderlands are and what the agricultural borderlands are. So finally, I would just think in a sense, those agricultural borderlands are not only restructuring physically the border, and there's also very interesting claims. I don't have the time to talk about them, but if we want, we could talk about it. By US citizens against the building of the wall, for example, because it affects their agricultural production, no? or because it affects their property, or because it has other, other, um, other, uh, there's other issues there, no? But also in the non physical borderlands, no, it has changed also. I mean, the corporality of Mexicans, the health of Mexicans, no? And also the incorporation of Mexican food as part of American food, if you can basically uh, define a very strict sense of American food, which is very open, very flexible, very changing, no culturally and anthropologically, no. So this, in, in a sense, this migration, this changes, even though you have the strict application of post 9-11 securitization of the border, uh, po uh, very, uh, strong claims in order to re-securitize the border by Republicans and by other right, far right wing groups, even though you have even private militias running around chasing and, uh, migrants and, and making migration a much more deadlier uh, endeavor, no? You also have this combination of illegalities or bending different laws, both Mexican and US law, in order to provide for that traditional authentic authenticity and that bonds of culture from a community, which most people, most of these migrants, maybe they're second or third generation and they're bringing back things which they remember that their grandmother cooked. And just one last thought about that. It's very interesting to see that many cooks in Mexico, in, in New York City who come from Mexico, they've never cooked in Mexico. This has a gender issue also, you know, because they were, Men, they were pampered in, uh, by their by many women. They were they were cared for by many women who were cooking for them, and they never worked in the kitchen. So when they start cleaning dishes or whatever, they remember the smells or seeing how their uh, the people who care for them, women, most of the time, almost all of the time, did their recipes. And they tried to recreate that. And that's how they've earned some places and started to become even sous chef or chef of a restaurant, no? representing, recreating, restructuring those kind of things. So I think that the agricultural borderlands and especially the food around the agricultural borderlands really is a way of understanding what happens in many other areas of the US-Mexican relation regarding the border, regarding migration, which both is condition, but also circumvents all the legal 
or the division between legality and illegality. No, thank you very much. Yeah. So are there um what a wonderful talk. Are there questions for me now? Comments? I have a question. Um, what what do you think? I want more than a question. I, I was wondering if you could give us a um please have you not um a prediction. prediction. Uh, I was very interested about what you said in the United States deeming certain sectors to be of national uh, security. Um, if, if, if certain parts of agriculture are, are, are now national security for the United States, what's your prediction on what can happen legally wise in areas in Mexico um, that where the US has interest in agriculturally and where the law is maybe not working, Mexican law is maybe not working in the favor of American interests. Like in the future, how do you think that would that would be uh, solved? Well, first of all, it's it's not only Mexico and the US. I think the World Food Summit was last year, no, the UN World Food Summit. And basically it was, if you could describe the World Food Summit is that it was a failure in many ways in which uh, NGOs, especially which wanted a stronger agenda on food sovereignty, on uh, the possibility of uh, making very strict changes in the food systems, for example, regarding waste, regarding global warming, regarding the production and use of water and everything. It was a complete failure because there was no consensus around it. The thing with national security is that you can always use it for the state of exception. No, it's basically the you enter into the state of exception, like you did with 9-11, no, with privacy, with migrant rights, with many, many issues. So when you categorize an industry as national security, to me, it's very troublesome at first. No. Second part is that maybe we are not so complementary in, in a way, in, in I mean in trade in agriculture, because even though you would say, well, Mexico, that's what the minister of economy who negotiated NAFTA said in Mexico, and he said it in a forum just like now, corn is not important to Mexico because we cannot compete with the US. But he said that, no, corn is not important to Mexico. A guy who eats tortillas probably uh, five times every week, you know, he thinks it's not important. You know, so if you ask a person who paid 10 pesos for a tortilla and then 50 pesos for a tortilla, I think it's very important, no? Well, the thing is that maybe we're not so complementary in that sense because the U.S. sees, for example, very strong agri uh, Mexican agricultural exports as a threat to the to to U.S. producers. For example, avocado, uh, tomatoes, uh, citrus, 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 yeah, sorry. Uh, oranges especially, and especially, uh, Frozen, it's very special. No? Frozen orange juice. It's very, very competitive in Mexico to, to the US. And it floods Florida, it floods uh, California. So you have a, a strong um, reaction against it. So adding to that the security issue, it's going to be, it's per se a very problematic issue with the, in the US Mexican relationship. But the thing is, I try to think not only think of it in an economic or legal sense or a social sense but also a cultural sense. The people who are growing those same, um, you know, those same oranges in Florida or in California used to be, or probably many of them are sons of Mexican farmers who came to the US or daughters of Mexican farmers who came to the US and who knew how to do, how to do agriculture, like for example, in the milpa, maybe not oranges, but they lost the ca capacity to grow milpa and to grow that agricultural system and to incorporate as workers, agricultural workers for mass production of oranges in the US, which flood also other markets. Sir. So, I mean, it's more structural in many ways. I think that the problem is 
not dependency from food products. And this is where the concept of food sovereignty is very dangerous in many ways because it brings security, it brings other issues into the table. But the problem is to guarantee more just relations. And I hate the word, but it would be more uh, basically uh, sustainable food systems not just guaranteeing the security of some products. No? For example, as we were, we heard in a presentation now, the US has enough food to feed the world three times over. It's reducing it. But, but the thing is that, may, for example, that corn, many of it goes for biofuels or for uh, uh, the production of other pr processed foods or for industrial use or whatever, and that competes no, with, with agricultural products uh, Use for food, for example. So the word security for me is a bad, bad, very, very threatening place to be you know, in many ways. But to tell you the truth, he's right in, in a way. I mean, those are security issues for the US, and who's gonna provide for them? Mexico. That's probably the, the only way to go. I had a guy came in here and he said three or four weeks ago, he does a lot of his studies with his professor on the border of, on a Texas side of the border in Mexico. Huh? And basically he ended his presentation with the pretty vocal conclusion that we're heading towards the day where there's no longer going to be a border on, the, or, uh, on our southern border. Mm -hmm. How optimistic do you think that is? And how many steps would be to to happen in order for that to happen, you know? Strangely enough, I'm not, I'm not, I am optimistic because I, I can tell you something. That's my personal story. My mother studied in San Diego, everything, you no? Know? She learned to swim in San Diego. She's from Tijuana. She, um, I mean, that's a very privileged position. I'm not taking into account my story as the whole story, but still, when that is possible, if that is possible for one person, it if we change some of the mindsets, it, it could be possible for other for other people and for most people. And in a sense, economically, it makes sense. I mean, nearshoring the concept is just another way of saying we are completely dependent on some uh, provisions of the supply chain in Mexico. This is the translation, the real translation. And if we really want to really forge the ability of getting those very, very, especially for example, lithium uh, or other, other uh, minerals, for example, or other industrial capacities, and also the workforce, no? It's fundamental for, for the US and Mexico to provide another type of scheme. And a closed border is not gonna provide for that. I mean, that's completely, we can all agree on that. But the worst part is to have I know what we have, which is a kind of bipolar system in which you have the entry, EC entry of drugs, guns, and products, no, and investment, no, but you have a complete necropolitical system with drones, border patrols, uh, 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 arrest, uh, criminal criminal procedures for for migrants, no, uh, for people. No? So, in a sense. I wouldn't anticipate when it's, that's going to happen, but it looks like it's going to happen. And at least in some parts of the border, maybe not look at it, uh, look at it completely because maybe, in, and, and it happens, I mean, practically, not legally, not politically, but practically there are times where border patrol or, or immigration officials kind of not look the other eye, but are not so present in some ways. And strangely enough, it's not just in economic uh, derived from economic cycles, but it can be from political cycles, from the need for some industries. For example, the, the whole issue in, in the COVID pandemic regarding uh, basic workers and fundamental workers and everything, and the provision for visas. In one sense, all the restrictions that there were for work visas, no, had to be. Not eliminated, but you had to have a contingency plan because you needed workers in order to continue to provide for basic services. So this is this. I mean, we've seen this very recently. You no, know? it's and this happened not only in the U.S. In Germany, Germany had to flew 
supply, I don't know how many agricultural workers to Germany to just to provide for basic needs, no, for example. So the problem is that if you leave it to discretionary political power, no, it's always going to be a wide range of this discretion for abuse, no, in many ways. No. And also it could turn the Qatarian or Emir or the way of the, the United Arab Emirates, in which you have complete populations of migrants, which are more present than the actual resident population who come to work and are expelled on a monthly or on different periods. That's that's where it's yeah. 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 And like in like the Bracero program was thought of in a way, no, in many ways, which was but but the Bracero program has also the, the thing is that it comes from agriculture and agriculture i don't know if you're familiar with the working conditions are no are i'm not saying normal because it would be to justifying the means but it's very common for the uh, agricultural workers to be seasonal workers who don't have permanence uh, really in the agricultural sector so it's kind of an extrapolation of that legal system in which an agricultural worker just works for the season which is supposed to be an exception in agricultural wor workers because you just you have a high demand for workers in a very small amount of period. So it's kind of a, a translation in, in international relations of that those kind of local arrangements in labor law. No? Example. I find it like interesting um, disagreeing about the reason that the water and um, having conflicts based on sector profit uh, for like it just made me laugh because it goes against the very logic of like revenue produced by migrant workers seasonally in the US and that thing is a major project. It's basically the same line of logic in you know uh, in the United States and Mexico. Like um I'm curious kind of about well, greater legal like sort of representation for that with resources and labor. Basically uh, investment uh international investment claims and international investment arbitration and international investment agreements are that. They're empowering private parties to uh, just uh, pursue uh, multi-million claims against public uh, issues, no? against public policy, basically. And this is not the worst case. I mean, this, wasn't, this, this didn't pass jurisdiction, so it, there's really, they lost that case. But there is like, for example, one regarding Mexico is the construction of a um, solid residues treatment plant in San Luis Potosí, which of course the population didn't want the typical not in my backyard thing in environmental issues, no? So they didn't want them to build this, this facility and they protested against this facility and everything. So the facility was closed when it was gonna open, it got constructed, but then it didn't work, it didn't function, no. So that company sued Mexico for $16 million. It, it won $16 million plus uh, interest rates, no. So, I mean, this happens. So, uh, in Canada and the US, this is not to put Mexico, but supposedly more closer allies and culturally supposedly much more closer to each other. Uh, Canada had enacted a law in which they prohibited an additive on gasoline that was prohibited in the US, but was provided by a US provider who could not sell it in the US in some states, and it was uh, producing it in Canada and selling it in Canada. It tried to ban that additive because of environmental issues, and before they passed the law in the Canadian Parliament, it was they they uh, started a claim and they figure out they should negotiate it and not uh, legislate on the issue. So that's how these issues work. You know, it's very very strong. So I mean, basically, many people say it's the privatization of private rights, and private claims against the public good, you know, in many ways. I think it's more complicated than that, but it basically gives you an idea of the public policy issues that are there, you know? especially in agriculture, especially in energy, especially in environmental issues, uh, and many times um, health provisions or other issues like, for example, unionizing and, and the work in, in certain sectors. No? Okay. Any questions online? I'm just curious. 
I think there was a message that said, can you tell us this argument again? But I don't, I can't remember. Yeah, actually, if you, yeah, maybe if he could pose the question again. Yeah. Of course, since you're showing that image, and, uh, and also you mentioned food, I guess it's uh, not really a question, but try to start a conversation is that, uh, I guess, you know, how much does, you know, how much does food you know, plays a role in your research or looking at this? And because when you show this image, I just have so many, you know, this words come out of my mind. It's mm -hmm. authenticity, like, okay. that's a, you know, a, another kind of loaded term. And also I, uh, another thing that, you know, I always want to do this research to look at the cultural enclaves, especially in, in New York City. It's a, uh, you know, to understand that, you know, one proxy is to look at uh, records uh, of, you know, this kind of, uh, in, in, you know, in different kind of, different kind of food, uh, you know, in terms of records. And also another idea, uh, you know, I want to just throw out here that, you know, my Google map is going to suggest, you know, restaurants that are you know, different from yours, probably, because on mine, it's all, you know, different Chinese restaurants across New York City. You know, in a way, I understand New York City in a completely different way than others, probably. And also, also this idea of conscious cultural enclave, because, you know, for example, I just, I just don't know how to order in such mm -hmm. restaurants, so that, you know, it's almost like, you know, entering another the image, right? I just don't know how to order uh, in such restaurant. You know, I just you know want to throw these ideas out and see how you want to respond. Or you know, if you were to ask to do a uh, you know research on cultural enclave in mm -hmm. your city, how would you go about that? No, first of I think it's a great question. Mm -hmm. And just to just to say that the concept of ethnic enclaves and immigration is is an old old. Well, is that old, outdated? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think all, some people do, but not me. I think it's a very powerful concept that has historical resonance, not only with Asian and uh, Latino or Latinx um, groups, but, but with groups from other parts of the world, you know, in, in really in parts of the nation's history. So, um, and food is, it, we used to have a professor here who taught a course on ethnic enclaves of food. And the course was you went and ate in different restaurants and read about them. It was a great class. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but uh, students, they might have gained a bit of weight. But... <laughs> well, it sounds great. I should have been a, a food anthropologist. Yeah, so. ethnic with food, food anthropology, food, uh, ge uh, cultural geography, uh, and um, food history. Well, it's very interesting you say that because I feel the same when I go to the Mexico City, there's a street that's called Articulo 123, Article 123, very, very interesting name because that's the, the article in the Constitution that regulates labor you know, in, in Mexico. And it's one of the great articles of the revolutionary constitution in 1917. But it's also the entry to Mexico City's Chinatown. And there's uh, the Chinese, um, the Chinese, uh, what's it called? I kind of remember uh, the, the the Chinese Chamber of Commerce, which I think it's more the Chinese Chamber of Commerce in the center of Mexico City, which is very specific. No, is there? No, and it has a restaurant, and it's in Mandarin. It, you enter there, and every every menu is in Mandarin. So imagine me looking at the menu in Mandarin, not even no, not even having the opportunity to understand the menu, you know, not even not knowing what to order. You know? So it's the same sensation. But it's also an enclave in, in many ways because that's the entrance to Chinatown. That's where Chinese New Year is celebrated and everything in that street and the other streets. You know? So about your question, you no. Know? First of all, there's the problem and, and this has to do with space, you know, thinking about geography and critical geography in many ways, because if we think of enclaves, of ethnic enclaves, it, it also we are thinking of a naturalization of the people only belong in that area. And that's a big, big problem. For example, Boyd Lloyd Kant's work on Paris, urban Paris, or whatever, kind of an abordion of saints is working, worked on that. But also you would say, well, 
you're from China, you're a person from Chinese origin in Mexico. Where do you live in Chinatown? No, I live in other parts. That's kind of the ghettoization of, of the cities, no? But still some very interesting things happen. In Zona Rosa in Mexico, which used to be traditionally a posh area for going out and then a gay LGTB uh, place. And now it, it has two, uh, two streets, which are Korean mainly, and you have Korean food staples. So if I want to buy Korean uh, products, I'll go there. If I want to buy Chinese products, I'll go to Chinatown, the, the typical like in New York City. No? But the problem with that is how much are we keeping those ghettos both in our mind and both for the authenticity of, for example, Chinese food in Chinatown. There are other Chinese restaurants, maybe they're different, maybe they're not from, from other parts of, uh, of China, no, they're Cantonese or whatever, and they're much more interesting or have a fusion between, I haven't seen this, but this would be great, no? Poblano cuisine and uh, Mandarin uh, food, uh, I don't know. So why do we keep containing these people in this area? This, the idea is very problematic because it still brings a tone to con geographical contention of people. And that takes us to the physical borderlands. You know, that takes us again to the border, to the border, inner borders of the city. So that's, in a sense, it's very, very complicated. And the issue, you, you touch on this issue, which is, I mean, I'm not the most gifted person to... <laughs> to talk about this, it would be great to talk about with a food anthropologist, but still the question of, of authenticity is basic. I mean, you need the authentic Mexican food with that delicious garlic steak. It's getting so expensive that only posh Mexicans and posh Americans eat those traditional staples of authenticity in very posh restaurants. And then the people in where we used to work, William in Santa Fe, you know, where I still work, uh, in this horrible Houston kind of like uh, uh, space of uh, downtown Houston in Mexico City where you can't walk from one place to the other, no? And you have literally hundreds of people eating in a cafeteria with maruchan, uh, ra instant ramen, no? And that's the traditional staple you know, of, that's, uh, of the part of Mexico. Many Mexicans probably have maruchan more than they have Mexican food. So what's what are the, the issues here? Is authenticity gonna bring us to be an, to, pro, to corner Mexican cuisine into an elitist uh, area or does authenticity really keep the culture? And also it has a gender issue. Authenticity, when you talk of authenticity in food in Mexico and in many places, but it, I'm making the case for Mexico, it's very gendered. That's the abuelita who does the tamales and the things. I'm thinking of my grandmother. No, the, she used to peel these birds. It was horrible, no? But she took the feathers and everything. They're coahuilotas. I haven't seen those birds anymore, but, but she did that, that thing. I, I used to see that. So if I want authentic, I want those birds from my abuelita and only my abuelita can do it. So only women get, get to do the care and, and do this care work on uh, pay care work, no? So it's it's kind of a, pro uh, a problem in many ways. Did research in Mexico City on street food, and like everybody goes and has street food, and you don't notice this, but in the street food community, uh, what what you're allowed to produce and sell is gender based. So uh, tacos are men, and only men are allowed to be taqueros, and quesadillas are women. Yes. Only women do it. And those are things you don't notice, but it's part of that uh, that culture. And those structures are uh, sometimes very gender normative and oppressive and stuff like that. And you don't you don't notice. It. And so, tam tamales are men because there are bicycles. They move around with yeah. tamales. So, but they're made by women. No? They're made by women. Made by but women the one so who has that. the mobility is the man. And the one who stays in the kitchen uh, long hours working in the contained area of the oikos almost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, the tortillas. The, when, yeah. Most tortillas are made by women's hands. No, for example. I, I had a comment. I was very taken with your discussion of the water battles. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's been a theme all semester. We've heard mm -hmm. a lot about water. And, and in the, um, it, I lived in California for many years. And 
And so it was very re reminiscent of the kinds of battles that happened between states in the United States over water. Uh, and, and this is a, it's more a comment than a question, uh, but to, to, to note that the ways in which the contestation over scarce resources is legalized uh, um, internally in the United States. For, and and uh, I think just internally in ways that are, are very reminiscent of the more evocative of the kinds of battles that you described the United States and Mexico have, or United States interests having with Mexican interests across the border using international authorities dominated by the United States to, um, to negotiate the terms. I, I think the outcomes in the US are, are less, um, are more two-sided. You're completely right, but I wouldn't take the fault out of the Mexican elites, which is a common thing, no? We always say, like, in the typical analysis of imperialism in Latin America, it's the U.S. that takes, and what about the alliance with Mexican elites? I mean, yeah. uh, I was... Yeah, it's very, excuse me, but uh -huh. the comment was, C.J. Alvarez's talk was written earlier by this person, yeah, and this was, and, and C.J. talked about that a lot, about the alliances across the border and the way to class interests were um, articulated. And uh, global yeah. class interests also. Global class interests also. But also, I mean, in Mexico, since NAFTA, I was uh, talking with William about this, but uh, Carlos Slim, of course, and, and Germán Larrea have the same income as 50% of the inhabitants of Latin America to Mexico. Right? The, the wealth. Well, yeah. Wealth. Yeah, yeah, not the income. They have to what income. Yeah, it's yeah. A property. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, the wealth has happened. I also have a comment. I don't know if it is a good question, but but um, something that's very interesting to me at in the beginning of your talk is that you said, you know, this idea that the legal frameworks and legality also shapes the space mm -hmm. along with structure, and and that to me was very interesting. What is even more interesting is like the last part of your talk was about how illegality shapes space, not necessarily the legal, but in architecture, we would call it informal or mm -hmm. <laughs> like because we don't want to call it mm -hmm. illegal and we don't want to work on that uh, binary dichotomy. Uh, so, and, and if I think of that, I wonder if, if is it like, Legality and structure is more like structure and agency in, mm -hmm. in the end, right? Because if that's the way you all, all the time, again, you fall into the, the mm -hmm. structural conversation. But um, I find that very interesting. And I wonder whether you can make a parallel on how all these spaces are actually shaped and depend on those border lands being. Uh, 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 forest, yeah. <laughs> sorry? Forest. forest, yes. Yeah. Well, I think you're just making the point I wanted to make, which I didn't make it very clear, but the possibility of amplification and also the possibility of collapse. I mean, legality is the shape of illegality also. I mean, in, they're both complementary in many ways. In the way legality is structured, it's not to provide for a channel for legality, it's for provide for a porous and changing division between legality and illegality. That's what law makes in many ways. And if we just concentrate on legality as a formal legality, you, the, the, the perfect example is the criminal court. When you have, um, you need murder in order to have uh, criminal code uh, regulation regarding uh, first degree murder, for example. You need the social practice of murder. And it's there's always going to be murder mm -hmm. if there's the regulation of murder. So the, the, the regulation, in a way, habilitates or recognizes the social existence of the illegality. So that always works with criminal law. It's a, probably the base, the the basic example. But with supply chain governance, what you do is, for example, what's legality? For me, it's legal to have, I have a perfect legitimate business in New York City, I hope so, <laughs> uh, uh, which has its seed in New York City, no? And it's uh, buying, um, let's say, uh, Citrix from Mexico, no? And, but 
I have, uh, I've just enabled, uh, I passed through a very difficult recognition for a uh, socially responsible enterprise and good work ethic and environmental uh, certification. I passed all of them in New York City, in the US, my company. But my company is provides for uh, buys uh, oranges from uh, child laborers in Mexico, you know, for example. But that's not my company. That's another company. You know? So what's the new structure? I mean, the supply chains were used like that. I what do I have to do to get the certification to be recognized so that my shareholders don't hold me accountable for anything illegal? Just subcontract, do a, a, a different legal scheme, uh, create a, an enterprise in Mexico, don't contract with this enterprise, contract to a third party or whatever, no? lack in labor issues, no, for example. But the problem is that now for, in the European Union, there's been uh, talk about this, well, they've already approved a directive in which you, which is called due diligence, which you have to be accountable for all the working conditions and environmental uh, violations and human rights violations that go out throughout the supply chain, you no? Know? So this changes the game in many ways. M many of those, uh, the way it's being implemented is, very recommendary, not with huge fines or whatever, but that's exactly what's happening. I mean, the supply chain go governance provided both for legality and illegality, it provided for legality to, for you to get the certification as a social responsible enterprise, and it provides for the illegality of yourself to not being held accountable for environmental disasters in Bhopal in India, or for not like the entire right, for example or not being uh, responsible for contamination of rivers with pesticides in, in Mexico or in Chile or in Peru or whatever. And also to, uh, to disentangle the legal obligations uh, from the supply chain uh, responsibility. You know? So that's, that's how I would answer that question. Not really theoretic, theoretically, but maybe pragmatically that in, that's why I say it shapes the space. Because what happens is you have spaces of illegal workers, no? And you have, but they come all the way into offices in the, around the Upper West Side, the British side of Manhattan, no, whatever, no? You have these great offices, completely unpolluted, completely illegally, but they have a geography and they have a connection with all those illegal practices no? because they contract from those illegal practices. The example is a recent litigation in France regarding. Uh, Casino Group, which is a French retailer, uh, owner of Pau de Azúcar, which is a big, the biggest uh, supermarket in Brazil, and Exito, which is the biggest supermarket chain in, in Colombia. And they bought beef without uh, the certification needed. So that was didn't come from areas which are deforested from the Amazon. So they they bought from this Brazilian um, uh, meat giant. And they, that meat giant bought basically cattle from deforested areas in the Amazon, in the state of Pará, in the state of, in the south of Colombia. So there's the litigation. So that's how it works. It's both legality and illegality in a sense. It's, it's both shades in a way. Well, I think we should say thank you to Jose for wonderful I'm not even going to tell you. Thank you. I hope it wasn't that boring with the legal issues, but I mean, no, 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 no. Very determined. Thank you. Because it's very, so many people are put out.